Exorcist comes from. I've had a movie back here a couple of years back, a dirty movie called The Exorcist. And Hollywood now evidently believes in demons more than uh, Christians do, or most Christians. And they had called this movie The Exorcist, and nobody knew where they got the word from. But the word is from the King James 1611 authorized version. The new Bibles don't have it. If you have a new Bible, the word exorcist is not in it. And you want to remember the King James is always up to date, and the others are archaic. Acts chapter 19, verse 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews exorcists. See it? E-X-O-R-C-I-S-T-S. That's where the word comes from. Comes 1611. And they named the movie after that. An exorcist is the man who is supposed to be able to cast out uh, demons. Then notice these fellows do a little streaking here. Verse 16. The man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them. So they fled out of that house naked. They fled. They ran. Naked and wounded. So run down the street without the clothes on. <laughs> so you have those things right there. Now, take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter uh, 5. And notice that the Bible here ha has a textbook on uh, demonology. The greatest textbook in the world on the spirit world and life after death is the Bible. These little pulp magazines like Life After Life, you know, for the kiddies. They don't, they don't know what they're talking about. We had a Swiss doctor come to Pensacola one time and lecture to the nurses. And she was a female Swiss doctor who was supposed to be an, an authority on uh, dying. She was supposed to attend more deathbeds than anybody else. She was an expert on death. <laughs> and when she got through making a fool out of herself, some Christian woman nurse there in the group of nurses, about 400 of them, asked her and said, Well, what should we tell the patient about getting saved from hell? And that Swiss doctor came unglued, boy, and her clutch plate burned out. She blew a couple of gaskets and valves. And she said, don't ever talk about that. There isn't any such thing as hell. And when she said that, uh, about 200 of the nurses applauded her. You know why they applauded her? They're all going to the same place. Folks about to move in he into hell always redec redecorate it, you know, recondition it before they move in so they'll be more comfortable. And I don't need any silly Swiss doctor talking to me about life after death. Don't waste my time. I've got a book here written by somebody who died and was buried and came up from the dead. Now, if I know about life after death, I wouldn't waste five minutes for the pulp literature. I'd get me a Bible. Now, the Bible is God's textbook on uh, demons. Uh, your King James Bible never used the word demons. The word demons is not a translation. It's a transliteration of a Greek word, demonion. And uh, the King James Bible never says demons. It says devils. Devils. That's the word that's used. The reason why the King James Bible used the word devils is because <clears throat> the old Greek philosophers taught that a demon was a good thing to have. As a matter of fact, uh, the ancient Greek philosophers like Maximenes and Anaximander and Pericles and Sophocles and uh, Plato and Aristotle and the rest of the boob in the booby hatch, they taught that if a man had a demon, it made him a genius. So when the King James Bible found the word demon, they translated it devil, so you'd know that there's no such thing as a good demon. There's no such thing as white witchcraft. That's for the kiddies that believe the newspapers and the news media. That's for all the comic magazine readers. There's no such thing as white witchcraft. There's no such thing as uh, white magic. Uh, you take uh, in the Word of God, the word is translated devils. For example, get Mark chapter 5 in one hand, get Luke chapter 8 and the other, and then when you get third hand, pick up 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Nothing like the King James Bible to put light in a dark place. 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4, Luke chapter 8, Mark chapter 5. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Some of you awful slow find this morning. Some of you aren't even looking. You have a Bible on you this morning? First Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart, depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of what? What? Devil. Louder. Devil. Plural. If you went to most Christian colleges in America, they'd tell you very frankly no such thing as devils. They said there's one devil and many demons. In the King James Bible, there's one devil and many devils. Nothing like a King James Bible career for a college education. Now look at here. There's one God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
by many gods. The devil's called the god of this world, and they're called gods in Psalm 82. Look at here. There's one son of God, virgin born, only begotten. How many of you are sons of God? Let me see your hands. Sit to me. I think a fellow could read the Bible. I mean, there's one God, there are many gods. There's one son of God, there are many sons of God. There's the angel of the Lord, there are angels of the Lord. There's one dragon, and by the way, they're dragons, plural. Isaiah chapter 34 and other places. If you have a new Bible, you won't find the word dragons in it. You find a new Bible translated by the Lockman Foundation, the fundamentalist, the word dragons won't be in it. Because your modern fundamentalist is an apostate. He doesn't believe in dragons. All right, now get Luke chapter 8 and look at verse 26. Luke 8, 26. Luke 8, 26. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to the to land, they met him out of the city a certain man, which had what? What? Louder. Long time and wore no clothes. See it? The display of the body is a mark of demon possession, devil possession. Taking off clothes is a mark of demonism. That's the characteristic of the age which you live in, strutting the flesh. He wore no clothes. You know what God did to Adam and Eve as soon as he kicked them out of the garden? <clears throat> he put clothes on. You ever read your Bible? They had fig leaves to cover up their loins with, and he made coats of skin. Lord, so that G-string and that bikini is not enough. You make a G-string or a bikini or a bathing suit, a modern bathing suit, you know, just like a diaper. Some of these grown ladies, 40 and 50 years old, look like an elephant in a diaper when they put on a bathing suit. <coughs> it's like a, look like a leaky fountain pen running down the legs. Now, you take... You take this business right here. What you call a bathing suit, you can make out of fig leaves. You ever have a fig tree? Look at the size of a fig leaf. Ten fig leaves are bigger than a modern bathing suit. So one of the characters of demons ask people is to like to take off their clothes and show the muscles. Mighty quiet there, Bridget. <laughs> Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. And they came over to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately they met him out of the tomb as a man, watch it carefully, with an unclean spirit, singular, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no not with chains. Verse 6, and when he saw Jesus so far off, he ran and worshipped him. All demon-possessed people are fundamentalists. There's no modernist in the bunch. There isn't one liberal anywhere in the Word of God of demon-possessed. Cattle do I'll give you $10,000 in cash. You can find me any demon-possessed man in the New Testament that doesn't believe in the deity of Christ and the virgin birth. Every one of them believes in it. James says, I believe if there is one God, thou doest well, the devils believe and tremble. James chapter 2. I don't know why people think that atheists are demon-possessed. They're not demon-possessed. They're just stupid. I mean, a man doesn't believe in God. Just He just, you know, he wasn't there when the deck was dealt. Got the pilot light blown out. <laughs> but you take every demon possessed person in that Bible who's devil possessed, believing the deity of Christ and the virgin birth. Verse 7 And cry with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the Most High God? <laughs> That's Simon Peter's profession of faith in Matthew 16. That fellow who was demon possessed over there in Acts 19 said, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? All demon-possessed people know Jesus Christ. Verse 8, For he said to him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit, singular. And he asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he answered and said, My name is Legion, for we, plural, are many. And he besought him much, he would not send him away out of the country. Now there was nigh to that mountain a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils, plural. All right, an unclean spirit is composed of devils. An unclean spirit has a composition. It is made up of devils. Verse 12, And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, we may enter into them. They're about to commit hogicide. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits, spirit, plural. See it? See it? You see it, don't you? You see it? You got it? You see it? 
Do you really see it? It's right there. <laughs> An unclean spirit is composed of unclean spirits, and those unclean spirits are called devils. You see where he gets it from? Right now. What are there? You said, is in Unger's book of demonology. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You said, I can't find a systematic theology book. They're written by men who corrected the King James. And you correct the King James, you don't know what you're doing. An unclean spirit is composed of unclean spirits. They're called devils. You say, you think you're right and everybody else is wrong? Absolutely. There's any question about it. Amen. I wouldn't ask your opinion today or tomorrow or the next day or anybody else. Where that book says it, that's it. And what you think is absolutely immaterial. Verse 14. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus, watch it, watch it, and see him that was possessed with the devil. Not demon possessed. Not possessed by the devil. Possessed with the devil. Folks talk about demon possession. Isn't there any such thing? The fellow is possessed with the devil, singular. You see the singular? Devil. Now, you know what that shows you? That shows you there's one devil, and that devil manifests himself by an unclean spirit. And that unclean spirit is composed of smaller unclean spirits, and they're called devils. That's the Bible teaching on demon possession. Now, some fellow sometime somewhere preached a homiletical outline, and he had a lot of alliteration in it, so it sounded real good. And he said there was demon obsession, demon possession, and uh, demon oppression, which makes a nice sermon outline. Now, the trouble is it just isn't true. Because of that, Christians have got the idea, well, no Christian can be demon-possessed. You can always spot a demon-possessed Christian by the Scripture he quotes. What does he quote? He always quotes, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's how you spot him. You know what he's trying to convince himself? He's trying to convince himself that some spirit he got in his body after he got saved was the Holy Spirit, and he always has his doubts about it, and he's afraid it might be an unclean spirit. So he says, greater is he the youth in the world, greater is he in the world, greater is he in the world. Now let me ask you, Christian, something. Suppose the one that in me is greater than he that is in the world, the devil. What does that mean? You know what that means? It don't mean one cotton-picking the fool thing in this world as far as demon possession goes. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians 5. Nothing like a Bible to clear up some of you dum-dums messing around all this stuff you shouldn't mess around with. 1 Corinthians 5. Now turn to it. If I'm hard on you, it's because you need it. You're not all dum-dum, but some of you are. Some of you got opinions that they would blacken the smokestacks of hell. And their opinions about the Word of God, about Christianity. First Corinthians five. Christian. It is reported commonly there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. <clears throat> That's incest. Interfamily relationships. You know, Sam Donahue and all that gas. I mean, discuss it, you know, let it all hang out, bring it out in the open, talk about it. Bible says, fellow there is having a relationship with his father's wife. What about that fellow? Well, he had somebody in him greater than him that was in the world. I said he had somebody in him that was greater than him that was in the world. Four. You don't think so? Keep reading. Four. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, watch it, to deliver such a one unto who? 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 Louder. Satan. Is that clear? That's the Christian turned over to the devil. Greater is he to you than he is in the world. So what? For the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Twelve. For what have I to do to judge them that are without, outside the church? Do not ye judge them that are within in the church, but them that are without God judges. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person in whom greater is he that is in you and he is in the world. 
the fellow is a fornicating pervert, and Christ is in him. Now listen, Christian. That Bible says to you, if you live after the flesh, you'll die. Romans 8, 13. Greater is he you than the world. That book says, if any man defile the temple of the Holy Ghost, him shall God destroy. Greater is he than the world. You can always tell a demon possessed Christian by the, by the scripture he quotes. He's trying to justify his sins, and he's so worried about the devil getting him that he's always trying to make you think the devil couldn't get him. And the devil's already got him. Now, let me tell you something. If you're saved, there's one thing about you the devil can't get. And when you say demon possession, people think, well, what he's trying to say is the devil can get his soul. The devil doesn't have to get your soul for you to be possessed with the devil. Now, you Christian people, you know how much of you Satan can get? Let's check it off. Your eyes, your ears, your nose, your mouth, your lips, your teeth, your tongue, your bladder, your heart, your lungs, your liver, your intestines, your throat, your hair, your imagination, your mind, your brain, your testimony, your character, your joy, your reputation, your health, your reward of the judgment seat of Christ, your inheritance, and your life. Now, wouldn't you say that was a pretty good hole? <laughs> that might not be possession, but you've got to admit, that sure is a hunk of you. You see, your body has never yet been redeemed. You see that flesh right there? That's never been redeemed. It's been paid for, but it isn't saved. You know what I'm waiting for? I'm waiting for the salvation of my body. Yeah. Yeah. These folks say, well, great is he you in the world. You know what they mean? They mean the devil's got hold of their eyes and their ears and their mind and their imagination, and they're trying to kid themselves. Now, listen. Be real practical here for a minute. This fellow, this maniac of Gadara, Mark chapter 5, you know how many demons he had in him, or devils? Get Mark chapter 5 in one hand, and the other hand pick up the book of Matthew, and get uh, about Matthew chapter uh, 9, well, about Matthew 8, Matthew 8, Mark 5. You know how many devils this fellow had in him? I mean, they're crawling on him. Matthew chapter 8, Mark chapter 5. Matthew chapter 8, verse 28. And when he was come to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs. Mark chapter 5, 2. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him with him a man with an unclean spirit. Now, Matthew mentions two, and Mark deals with one. And that's the way Matthew and Mark write. For example, when Jesus was coming down to Jericho in the crime country, the Bible said there were two blind men that sat by the wayside begging. Matthew. But when Mark picks up the account, Mark says, And blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the way wayside begging. See? Matthew will give you the number, and then Mark will deal with the individual. Now, in Mark chapter 5, you only read about one. But in Matthew chapter 8, you read there were two of them there. Now, turn to Mark chapter 5, and look at verse 13, and look what happened when these two had the devils cast out of them, of which Mark relates in detail the history of one. Mark chapter 5, 13, And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out, and entered the swine. The herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. I don't know, a preacher said that was the first case in the Bible of deviled ham. And ran by down a steep place in the sea. Now watch it. And there were about 2,000. See that? 2,000. You know what that means? It means each one of those fellows had a thousand devils in it. Now you know something. If you're sitting here this morning, you've got a thousand devils in you, they must be awful small. Mary Magdalene had seven. If you had a thousand devils in you, they couldn't be much bigger than the end of your finger, or they couldn't get in you. What is a devil? Well, let's see. Take your Bible and get Ecclesiastes chapter 10 in one hand. Um, you're never going to find out reading commentaries. Every time a man corrects that Bible, the Lord pulls the blind down on him and turns off the light. Please ask his chapter 10 in one hand, and let's get uh, Mark 4 in the other. Mark 4, please ask his 10. What is a devil? What is a demon? What does it look like? Could you draw one? Please ask his chapter 10, Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verse 3. 
Mark 4, verse 3, Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, he sowed, some fell by the wayside, watch it careful, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. What are the fowls of the air? Verse 15. I don't have to interpret anything for you. The Bible interprets itself. 15. And these are they by the wayside, for the word is sown, but when they have heard, what? What? Louder. He's called fowls in verse 4. So winged animals. He's got wings. Birds. Please ask his chapter 10, verse 20. Please ask his 10, verse 20. Don't you know Alfred Hitchcock and the birds? I mean, surely you know about the Birdman Alcatraz, don't you? Or was it Jonathan Seagull or something like that? Please ask these 10, 20. And sure folks say strictly for the birds? You know what the Germans say? They say, Er hat ein Vogel. He's got a bird. You Yankees say bird brain. You know, strictly for the birds? The flying. Please ask these 10, 20. Nothing like a Bible to clear up a seminary education. Please ask these 10, 20. Curse not the king, no, not my thought. Curse not the rich in my bedchamber. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell of the matter. So when the ladies pick up a juicy bit of gossip, you know what they say? They say, a little bird told me. You understand? A little bird, they're real small. Revelation chapter 17. Nothing like a Bible to clear up the National Association for the Advancement of Science and all that hee-haw. <laughs> Revelation chapter 18. Revelation 18. The Bible is always more scientific than any scientific textbook written by any scientist. People say, well, the Bible's not a textbook on science, but where it speaks of science, it speaks accurately. You're wrong. There's only one perfect textbook in science ever written. I've got it right in my hand. You know what the word science means? It means knowledge. If you don't believe it, get you a new Bible and look at 1 Timothy 6.20 where they mistranslated it. You've got this book here. You have the only book that never has to be changed to line up with what they find. Whatever they find that so matches up with this. Whatever they find that isn't so, they have to change. You know what you've got in the Louvre in Paris? That's a big library. You have five and a half miles of books on shelves. That building eight or nine stories high, you know, a city block, and those bookshelves, you know, six feet apart, running up 20 decks. You know what they've got in that library? They've got a mile and a half of books on science that are obsolete. Those silly asses had to revise their scientific facts better than a hundred times a year for a hundred years. And they got a mile and a half of books for scientific facts that aren't facts. You know what I've got right here? i got a little book I can put in my pocket. I never have to change one word of it to line up with anything anybody ever found or is ever going to find. Amen. Amen. Because it's a textbook on science. Revelation 18. Revelation 18, verse 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and cage of every unclean and hateful what? What? Bird. You hear a buzzing in your head? <laughs> you hear a ringing in your head? <laughs> Do you hear voices? <laughs> or are you cuckoo? Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. <laughs> they say the guy is crazy. They say he's cuckoo. Why do they say that? It's birds. Strictly for the birds. Now, here we are in an auditorium here and around 10.30 in the morning, Dayton, Ohio. What do you got in this room? Why, well, you'd just be amazed you know what you had in this room. <laughs> Suppose I had me a short wave set. So I haven't got one. Suppose I have one right there. And I pick the short wave set up and I get Brussels, Belgium, and I touch that microphone with it and Brussels fades out, you know, and Paris comes in. Or I take this thing and it's on loud, and I put it behind me, and the volume goes down. Or I take it, put it on here, and the volume's up, and I walk away from it, and the volume goes down. Why is that? 
You know, people just charge in there, you know, electronics, protons, neutrons. I know what they're talking about. You know something? Right in this room here in Dayton, Ohio, you know what's going through your head right now? If you have the equipment to pick it up? About 15 shortwave stations, about 50 AM stations, about 20 FM stations, and about eight television channels, three of them in color. <laughs> and they're going right through your head. And if you had the equipment to pick them up, you could pick them up. Isn't it a blessing that you can't pick them up? What if you picked them all up at one time? You know what you're doing? You'd be tripping. And some of you young people are stupid enough to fool with drugs. That's what you've been doing. You know what happens when a fellow gets full of drugs? He tunes in. And he doesn't have the right stuff to get the stuff out with. Now, if that was an off and on switch, and that was a volume, that was a condenser, you know. And this thing here was something else. You, could, you know, and tune that thing in and cross out what's right and picking what you, you, you know, cross out wrong, picking what you want to hear. But when you get full of drugs, you know what happens? You get part of this TV program, part of that symphony orchestra, part of this da jazz band, part of this rock music, and then a little color, you know, thing slips off a building, comes up like this, busts out in the frogs, go off a rail, drop off a tree, cross that checkers come across, and the crane comes staying down it. What are you doing? You're watching TV. It's in this room. You say, I never think so unscientific. Why, you fool, if you had a battery-operated TV set, you could pick it up in this room. You don't have to plug that thing in the wall to pick it up. It ain't coming through the wall. It's in the air. If you had a radio set right here, battery-operated, and turn that thing on, you could pick up scores of stations. You say, why? It's in the air. You see? <laughs> and in that air, there are unclean spirits. It's filled with them. The longer I preach, the more and more I realize that maybe 10% of the Christians I talk to are possessed with demons, and they're running over with them. And when you talk to them, they, they don't act right. You say something funny, and they don't laugh, not ready for it. You say something sad, they don't cry. You say something scary, they don't get scared. When you say something the Holy Spirit uses, they turn to each other. <laughs> Boy, I've been in young people's meetings where every time you came right down, you see two heads turn toward each other. Then you say something else. I mean, just caught kids just a stuff full of demons, a turkey stuff full of Christmas dress. And you talk, you know what they'd say. They'd say, well, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Demons. Now, our time's about up. I've got five minutes to go here, and we haven't even got a good start yet. But in the time I've been saved, I've only dealt with about five demon-possessed people. All of them were fundamental Bible-believing Baptists. There wasn't a liberal in the bunch. And on five of those people, when I put my finger on them and I said, you unclean spirit, come out of them, I got results right on the spot. Nobody had to pray for them and plead the blood over them, you know, and sing hymns and put a wooden cross on them. Why, some of you dumb, stupid Christians here this morning, you think a cross can cast out demons. A cross is an instrument for a curse. Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Folks say, well, Brother Upton, I just can't stand all that negativism. You know why you can't? Because you're full of them. I mean, you start talking about these things, the demon will rise up in you and say, <coughs> I mean, talk about love, talk about peace. <laughs> be sweet, be nice, share <laughs> Bird, boy, bird brain. <laughs> I was preaching a meeting down there in Florida about five years ago, and a guy stood right in the middle of the service. And he said, do you confess that Jesus Christ is coming uh, flesh or not? I just finished preaching the virgin birth. <clears throat> he didn't have any problem. And I said, look, fella, I said, if God called you to preach, you called me to preach. I know he called me to preach. Don't know about you. And he stood up there and said, do you believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? I said, now, God, not the author of confusion. He didn't call two of us to preach at the same time. Do you believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh? I put my finger on him. I said, you unclean spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of him. I thought I stood there. Couldn't open his mouth again. It's like he had a lockjaw. 
And after about a half a minute, a couple of deacons came down the aisle and quietly escorted him out the back end of the door. Couldn't get his mouth open. I had a Christian dispute one time, get arguing, you know, me about a certain thing. And finally they hauled off and smacked me right in the face. And I turned my face and tried the other side. And they tried the other side. And I said to that Christian, I said, you see there, i got more religion on one side of my face, you've got both sides of yours. And that Christian said, damn you, damn you. Christians do that, well, you know, greater is he that isn't you, you know, that kind of stuff. And I pointed a finger at that Christian, and I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out! And that Christian hit the floor like a sack of potatoes. I mean, just dropped on the floor. One night we had a prayer meeting, you know, a bunch of people, you know, and it was back in the early days when I was a new Christian. And that's what I was trying to get everything that God had for me. You know, we were praying for tongues and everything else, laying on our hands and all that kind of business. And we were in a prayer shack praying one night, about eight of us, and I noticed one fellow was climbing another fellow's prayers. They're great imitators, great counterfeits. All the charismatics in Pensacola try to follow us on the street as soon as we finish preaching. They never had any street meetings until we had street meetings, and they came in right after them. They try to get radio time right after you don't do what you do. They're great counterfeiters. Greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. <laughs> anyway, we got praying on this thing, and I heard one guy climbing a fellow's prayer. A guy would pray and say, Lord, take us out in the street this weekend, give us souls. In the dark, another guy's voice saying, take us out in the street this weekend, give us souls. This other guy's praying, Lord, wash us in the blood, Lord, fill us with the Spirit. Wash us in the blood and fill us with the Spirit. After that prayer meeting is over, <clears throat> I follow that guy down the road. And I said, now, God forgive me for judging you. I probably should have been paying attention to the Lord instead of listening to you. But I said, if I'm wrong, pray for me, brother. But I said, it just seems to me like you're not right with the Lord. Something's wrong. You're not coming through. And that fellow said, well, Brother Peter said, I have some trouble. He told me about his trouble. Pretty rough, too. Pretty rough. <laughs> and I said, well, how about not coming back to prayer meeting? You get that thing fixed up. He said, okay. So he left. And after about four weeks, he came back to that prayer meeting, came there, glory to God, hallelujah, praise the Lord, greater is he that is you than he in the world, that kind of stuff, you know, and got the victory, you know, praise God, hallelujah, bless you, Jesus, all that gas, you know. And he came in there, and we got praying, and there in that dark room with the lights off, I hear us praying at the same time, I heard him climbing this guy's voice again. And about that time in the dark there, a hand reached out in the dark. We are in a little close building, about eight feet square, eight of us, <laughs> all praying at the same time. And a hand reached out and laid on my knee there in the dark. Now, I was raised in the street. Nothing naive about me, man. I, was, I wasn't raised. I was drug up. When I was about 10 years old, I went to a theater one time. And I had a fellow about 45 years old sit down and put his hand on my knee in the theater when I was about 10 years old. You know what I did? I got up and yelled, Usher! <laughs> that old boy took off like a scalded dog. And there in the dark, I felt that hand come out across my knee, and I put my finger out there in the dark and put it right in that bird's face. And it wasn't three inches from his nose. And I said, You unclean spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of it. You know that fellow prayed? Just like this. He said, Lord, give us souls this weekend. Lord, help us to live for thee. And Lord, we just hope and pray that God would bless us for the weekend. I got it. And he left the prayer meeting and never came back. Now, you know what I do? I cast out moan demons. I wouldn't pay an exorcist for nothing. If you don't pay your exorcist, you're liable to be repossessed. <laughs> Some of you didn't laugh quick enough, did you? Caught you sleeping, didn't I? Uh-huh. Yep. Evil communications corrupt good manners. <laughs> you know something? When I go to bed at night, I get down my bedside and I say, In the name of Jesus Christ, you unclean spirits, get out of me. Lord, I want a bloodbath. Only well, we wash the blood of Jesus Christ, you devils and demons, get out of me and stout of me and don't bother me. You think it doesn't work? Try it. You know what I think? I think you're the living in the bottom of a pool, and that water is 20 miles over your head, and it's got at least 50 demons per square inch in it. 
And you Christian people have been messing around with TV and magazine and newspapers. Some of you are crawling with them. And that's why you can't take a straight Bible message in plain language. It's got to be fixed up for you. You're set. All right, I'm going to give it to your pastor now. There's no way to get set for me. You can't get prepared for me because I don't know what I'm going to say, so you sure can't figure it out. <laughs> and the only way you can get prepared for me is just sit there and get and relax and just take what comes because there's no way to get set for it. Plain talker. Father, bless the message. Lord, bless these Christians. May they not only realize that Christ's in them, but they better do something about it. They better give their vessels and their bodies a living sacrifice to God. They better yield to the Holy Spirit, not to Satan. And they better yield their members to God as those will be live from the dead. And they better continue instant in season, out of season in prayer. May they realize it's a fight. There's nothing taken for granted. Help them to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and fight the good fight of faith. And not be so stupid as to claim one verse to get them out of a mess they're in because they yielded to the devil and were deceived by the devil. Lord, cleanse these Christians as fit vessels for your service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.